History of Zimbabwe, Heroic and Dramatic. History of Zimbabwe Description. Following the Lancaster House Agreement of 1979 there was a transition to internationally recognized majority rule in 1980, the United Kingdom ceremonially granted Zimbabwe independence on 18 April that year. In the 2000s Zimbabwe's economy began to deteriorate due to various factors, including mismanagement and corruption, the imposition of sanctions such as among others the Zimbabwe Democracy and Economic Recovery Act of 2001, following the switch from willing buyer, willing seller to fast-track land reform. Economic instability led several members of military of Zimbabwe the military to try to overthrow the government in a coup date on 2007. Prior to its recognized independence as Zimbabwe in 1980, the nation had been known by several names. Rhodesia, Southern Rhodesia and Zimbabwe Rhodesia. Pre-colonial era. 1000-1887. Prior to the arrival of Bantu speakers in present-day Zimbabwe the region was populated by ancestors of the San people who were present in the region when the first Bantu-speaking farmers arrived during the Bantu expansion around 2000 years ago. These Bantu speakers were the makers of early Iron Age pottery belonging to the Silver Leaves or Matola tradition, 3rd to 5th centuries AD found in southeast Zimbabwe. This tradition was part of the eastern stream of Bantu expansion which originated west of the Great Lakes, spreading to the coastal regions of southeastern Kenya and northeastern Tanzania, and then southwards to Mozambique, southeastern Zimbabwe and Natal. More substantial in numbers in Zimbabwe were the makers of the Zewangukamir ceramic wares. Of the 4th century AD their early Iron Age ceramic tradition belonged to the highland spaces of the eastern stream, which moved inland to Malawi and Zimbabwe. Imports of beads have been found at Gukamir and Zewa sites, possibly in return for gold exported to the coast. A later phase of the Gukamir culture was the Zizo in southern Zimbabwe. Zizo communities settled in the Sheish Limpopo area in the 10th century. Their capital there was Shroda, just across the Limpopo River from Zimbabwe. Many fragments of ceramic figurines have been recovered from there, figures of animals and birds and also fertility dolls. The inhabitants produced ivory bracelets and other ivory goods. Imported beads found there and at other Zizo sites are evidence of trade, probably of ivory and skins with traders on the Indian Ocean coast. Another question is the branches of the Bantu languages which they spoke. It seems that the makers of the Ziwa, Gukamir wares were not the ancestral speakers of the Shona languages of today's Zimbabwe who did not arrive in there until around the 10th century from south of the Limpopo River and whose ceramic culture belonged to the western stream. The linguist and historian Eret believes that in view of the similarity of the Ziwa, Gukamir pottery to the Nkopa of the ancestral Nyasa language speakers, the Ziwa, Gukamir people spoke a language closely related to the Nyasa group. Their language, whatever it was, was superseded by the ancestral Shona languages, although Eret says that a set of Nyasa words occur in central Shona dialects today. The evidence that the ancestral Shona speakers came from South Africa is that the ceramic styles associated with Shona speakers in Zimbabwe from the 13th to the 17th centuries can be traced back to Western Stream, Kalundu, pottery styles in South Africa. The Ziwa, Gukamur and Zizo traditions were superseded by Leopard's Copt and Goman wares of the Kalundu tradition from the 10th century. Colonial era, 1888-1980. In the 1880s, the British arrived with Cecil Rhodes's British South Africa Company. In 1898, the name Southern Rhodesia was adopted. In 1888, British colonialist Cecil Rhodes obtained a concession for mining rights from King Lobongila of the Bell Peoples. Cecil Rhodes presented this concession to persuade the government of the United Kingdom to grant a royal charter to his British South Africa Company. Suck over Madubaland and its subject states such as Mashinaland. Rhodes sought permission to negotiate similar concessions covering all territory between the Limpopo River and Lake Danganyika, then known as Zambia. 
the Shona staged unsuccessful revolts, known as Chimarenga, against encroachment upon their lands, by clients of 2nd Cecil Rhodes in 1896 and 1897. Following the failed insurrections of 1896-97 the Bell and Shona groups became subject to Rhodes's administration thus precipitating European settlement en masse which led to land distribution disproportionately favoring Europeans, displacing the Shona, Bell and other indigenous peoples. Southern Rhodesia became a self-governing British colony in October 1923, subsequent to a 1922 referendum. Rhodesians served on behalf of the United Kingdom during World War II, mainly in the East African campaign against Axis forces in Italian East Africa. In 1953, in the face of African opposition, Britain consolidated the two colonies of Rhodesia with Nyasaland, now Malawi, in the ill-fated Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland which was dominated by Southern Rhodesia. Growing African nationalism and general dissent, particularly in Nyasaland persuaded Britain to dissolve the Union in 1963, forming three colonies. As colonial rule was ending throughout the continent and as African majority governments assumed control in neighboring northern Rhodesia and in Nyasaland, the white minority Rhodesia government led by Ian Smith made a unilateral declaration of independence UD, from the United Kingdom on November 11, 1965. The United Kingdom deemed this an act of rebellion but did not re-establish control by force. The white minority government declared itself a republic in 1970. A civil war ensued with Joshua Nkomo's Zipu and Robert Mugabe's Zanu using assistance from the governments of Zambia and Mozambique. Although Smith's declaration was not recognized by the United Kingdom nor any other power, Southern Rhodesia dropped the designation Southern and claimed nation status as the Republic of Rhodesia in 1970 although this was not recognized internationally. Independence and the 1980s In the election Mugabe's Zanu party wins a decisive victory over Kamo and Zipu. The newly independent nation takes the ancient name Zimbabwe. Mugabe rules at the start in a conciliatory manner. The provisions to protect European political rights are respected. Smith continues to serve as a member of parliament until 1987. Nkomo is brought into the cabinet. However there is an underlying conflict between Sandu and Zipu. The former draws its support from the majority Shona people, while Zipu is linked with the minority, but historically dominant, Bell. Tribal hostilities become a noticeable feature of Zimbabwe's political life after Mugabe dismisses Nkomo from his cabinet in 1982, just two years after independence. In 1987 the two leaders make a new attempt to resolve the nation's divisions by merging their parties as Zanu PF, making Zimbabwe effectively a one-party state. At the same time the constitution is changed to give Mugabe the role of executive president. Nkomo subsequently serves as a vice president, until his death in 1999. During the 1980s Mugabe's Marxist policies do harm to the economy, but in the changing fashion of the 1990s there is a move towards a market system. There is also a token gesture towards multi-party democracy, though this does nothing to prevent Zanu PF winning 98% of the seats in parliament in 1995. In 1996 Mugabe is elected unopposed for a new six-year term as president. Several factors cause widespread unease about Zimbabwe after 20 years of independence. Political opponents are persecuted. Scythe Hall, for example, is evicted from his farm in 1994 and is arrested in 1995 for allegedly plotting to assassinate Mugabe. It is widely suspected that the underlying purpose in each case is to dissuade him from standing as a presidential candidate in 1996. The white community is unsettled by frequently announced plans to appropriate many of their farms without compensation, for redistribution to Africans. And there are allegations of financial corruption in senior government circles. The underlying tensions flare up in dramatic fashion during the first half of 2000. In February Mugabe is defeated in a referendum designed to increase his hold on power. 
His immediate response is to escalate his long-standing campaign to appropriate the larger commercial farms owned by white Rhodesians. Mugabe's armed supporters, described as veterans of the war for independence, forcibly occupy some 500 farms, out of a total of 4,500 owned by whites. Meanwhile a new opposition party, the MTC, Movement for Democratic Change, formed in January and led by a trade unionist, Morgan Svein Irod, shows signs of being able to mount a very serious challenge to ZANU PF in forthcoming elections. The election campaign is marred by high levels of violence and intimidation from Mugabe supporters, resulting in 30 or more deaths. Even so, the result is close. ZANU PF wins 62 seats in the new assembly, with MTC just short of victory with 57. Immediately after the election, in June 2000, Mugabe publishes a list of 804 large commercial farms, most, but not all, white-owned, which are to be appropriated by the state for the resettlement of peasants. He insists that compensation is the responsibility of the British government. This is something which in a principle is agreed in London, since it is widely recognized that the ancestors of the British farmers claimed dubious ownership over these lands a mere hundred years ago. On independence in 1980 there was an agreed scam for compensation. It was discontinued by Britain in 1988 on the grounds that the benefit was accruing not to Zimbabwe's peasants but to the political elite. Of 2,000 farms acquired by the government in this way, 420 were transferred to the ownership of prominent ZANU PF supporters. The land problem is likely to remain on Zimbabwe's political agenda rather longer than Mugabe himself, whose dictatorial behavior and attempts to cling to power become increasingly extreme as the new millennium progresses. 2003-2005 Divisions within the opposition MTC had begun to fester early in the decade, after Morgan's ARI was lured into a government sting operation that videotaped him talking of Mr. Mugabe's removal from power. He was subsequently arrested and put on trial on treason charges. This crippled his control of party affairs and raised questions about his competence. It also catalyzed a major split within the party. In 2004 he was acquitted, but not until after suffering serious abuse and mistreatment in prison. The opposing faction was led by Welshman Cube who was the general secretary of the party. In mid-2004, vigilantes loyal to Mr Tsvang Irai began attacking members who were mostly loyal to Cube, climaxing in a September raid on the party's Harare headquarters in which the security director was nearly thrown to his death. In May 2005 the government began Operation Moran Batsvina. It was officially billed to rid urban areas of illegal structures, illegal business enterprises and criminal activities. In practice its purpose was to punish political opponents. The UN estimates 700,000 people have been left without jobs or homes as a result. Families and raiders, especially at the beginning of the operation, were often given no notice before police destroyed their homes and businesses. Others were able to salvage some possessions and building materials but often had nowhere to go, despite the government's statement that people should be returning to their rural homes. Thousands of families were left unprotected in the open in the middle of Zimbabwe's winter. The government interfered with non-governmental organization NGO efforts to provide emergency assistance to the displaced in many instances. Some families were removed to transit camps where they had no shelter or cooking facilities and minimal food, supplies and sanitary facilities. The operation continued into July 2005, when the government began a program to provide housing for the newly displaced. 2006-2007 in August 2006 runaway inflation forced the government to replace its existing currency with a revalued one. In December 2006, ZANU-PF proposed the harmonization of the parliamentary and presidential election schedules in 2010. The move was seen by the opposition as an excuse to extend Mugabe's term as president until 2010. 
Zimbabwe's bakeries shut down in October 2007 and supermarkets warned that they would have no bread for the foreseeable future due to collapse in wheat production after the seizure of white-owned farms. The Ministry of Agriculture has also blamed power shortages for the wheat shortfall, saying that electricity cuts have affected irrigation and halved crop yields per acre. The power shortages are because Zimbabwe relies on Mozambique for some of its electricity and that due to an unpaid bill of $35 million Mozambique had reduced the amount of electrical power it supplies. On December 4, 2007, the United States imposed travel sanctions against 38 people with ties to President Mugabe because they played a central role in the regime's escalated human rights abuses. Deterioration of the educational system The educational system in Zimbabwe which was once regarded as among the best in Africa, has gone into crisis because of the country's economic meltdown. Almost a quarter of the teachers have quit the country, absenteeism is high, buildings are crumbling and standards plummeting. One foreign reporter witnessed hundreds of children at Hatcliffe Extension Primary School in Epworth, 12 miles west of Harare, writing in the dust on the floor because they had no exercise books or pencils. The high school exam system unraveled in 2007. Examiners refused to mark examination papers when they were offered just Z$ 79 a paper enough to buy three small candies. Corruption has crept into the system and may explain why in January 2007 thousands of pupils received no marks for subjects they had entered, while others were deemed excellent in subjects they had not sat. Various disused offices and storerooms have been turned into makeshift brothels at the University of Zimbabwe and Harare by students and staff who have turned to prostitution to make ends meet. Students are destitute following the institution's refusal in July to reopen their halls of residence, effectively banning students from staying on campus. Student leaders believe this was part of the administration's plan to take revenge on them for their demonstrations over deteriorating standards. 2008 Elections Zimbabwe held a presidential election along with a 2008 parliamentary election of 29 March. The three major candidates were incumbent President Robert Mugabe of the Zimbabwe African National Union, Patriotic Front, ZANU-PF. Morgan Svayri of the Movement for Democratic Change, Svayri, MPCT, and Simba Makoni, an independent. As no candidate received an outright majority in the first round, a second round was held on June 27, 2008 between Svayri, with 47.9% of the first round vote, and Mugabe, 43.2%. Svayri withdrew from the second round a week before it was scheduled to take place, citing violence against his party's supporters. The second round went ahead, despite widespread criticism, and led to victory for Mugabe. Range Time and Fields Massacre In November 2008 the Air Force of Zimbabwe was sent, after some police officers began refusing orders to shoot the illegal miners at Range Time and Fields. Up to 150 of the estimated 30,000 illegal miners were shot from helicopter gunships. In 2008 some Zimbabwean lawyers and opposition politicians from Muter claimed that Shearing was the prime mover behind the military assaults on illegal diggers in the diamond mines in the east of Zimbabwe. Estimates of the death toll by mid-December range from 83 reported by the Muter City Council, based on a request for burial ground to 140 estimated by the Opposition Movement for Democratic Change Zvayari Party. 2009 Present In January 2009, Morgan Zvayari announced that he would do as the leaders across Africa had insisted and join a coalition government as Prime Minister with his nemesis, President Robert Mugabe. On February 11, 2009 Svayri was sworn in as the Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. By 2009 inflation had peaked at 500 billion percent per year under the Mugabe government and the Zimbabwe currency was worthless. The opposition shared power with the Mugabe regime between 2009 and 2013. Zimbabwe switched to using the US dollar as currency and the economy improved reaching a growth rate of 10 percent per year. 
In 2013 the Mugabe government won an election which The Economist described as rigged, doubled the size of the civil service and embarked on misrule and dazzling corruption. Hmm.